Of all the exports from the West, breast cancer is one of the most insidious. What was once described as a curse of the rich is now on the march through the developing world. In West Africa, more than half of women with breast cancer will die from the disease. Journalist Chika Odua has been to find out why. I want to figure out why is breast cancer killing so many women in sub-Saharan Africa? When in the West, a lot of women survive breast cancer and actually go on to live very happy lives. But it's a completely different story here. 20 years ago, I would have been worried about dying from malaria or TB or HIV AIDS. But now the risk of contracting cancer is the price of a population living healthier and living longer. Superstition and fear mean that many women seek the help of alternative healers such as priests or herbalists first. Society has deep cultural issues with the removal of a breast. And the use of modern drugs to treat the disease is costly and comes with unpleasant side effects. All of which create a perfect storm, causing women to die too early. So these are some of the questions that we want to explore. And these are some of the taboos and the cultural issues that clash with getting modern medical treatment. So I'm going to join Africa's leading undercover journalists. And together, we're going to try to figure out and explore why breast cancer is killing so many women in sub-Saharan Africa, while breast cancer is completely treatable if it's detected on time. I've come to Kumasi. Ghana's second largest city. At the heart of this bustling place, I'm looking for somebody who promises to cure breast cancer with herbs. For a lot of women with breast problems, she is the first stop. Behind the courtroom where she works as a cleaner, I meet Naomi Nyarko. It's here that she sells her homemade cures for cancer at $2 a time. She tells me that she even used some of them to cure her own cancer. There's no medical evidence to support her claims or that she ever had cancer. But her sister-in-law died from the disease, and Naomi claims she could have saved her. <laughs> Naomi says she has plenty of customers who have cancer, and as in the rest of the world, there's no shortage of individuals and businesses offering to cure cancer at a price. I've enlisted Africa's preeminent undercover journalist, Anas Aramea Anas, to help me investigate. Anas has revealed quack cures for illnesses before, and he doesn't need much convincing. Usually in our part of the world, when people get sick, they consider all sort of things. Most importantly, going to see their traditional healers. This can come in the form of pastors, it can come in the form of malams or traditional fetish priests. We've recruited Fusina to help us. She has just been diagnosed with breast cancer, and we've asked her to follow the same route taken by many people here in Ghana who are worried about their health. We're on our way to see a typical spiritual healer who we've heard is handing out magic cures for cancer at $50 a time. The faith healer that the undercover pair have come to meet is called Pastor O.P., and he's quick to make a very precise diagnosis. When we tell him that Fusina has cancer, Pastor O.P. remains confident that his powers are greater than any hospitals. Uh, 
And it seems that God and a mystery oil will be enough to save Fusina's life. Faith healers are enormously popular in Ghana. There are more of them than conventional doctors, and nearly every Ghanaian will visit one. So when women seek help from them, they may genuinely believe that they're taking practical steps to cure their illness. You see this craziness? This is what we are up against in Africa. We have these people, traditional healers, spiritual leaders, and etc., masquerading as angels and taking advantage of sick people. And all this for what? And the thing is, while they are spending time and money with these people, they are not getting the proper attention and what they need to save their lives. So whenever she needs to be admitted, we admit, we give the blood, we give the IV antibiotics that she needs to. While yeah. such consultations may be comforting to believers, there's a terrible price to pay if a breast cancer patient fails to see a doctor in time. Augustina did the right thing and saw a doctor first, but then she was told that she would have to have her breast removed. So he told me that he has to remove the breast, and I was scared and ran away. And I called my sister. She's in Accra and told her that this is the problem I'm facing here. And so she told me I should come back to Accra. And she has someone who will help me. Not when you say herbalist. So she sent me to the herbalist. I spent one month there. I didn't see any improvement. Okay, Augustina is myself. what doctors call a late-stage presentation. She only came here after the disease had taken hold. Now, her disease is terminal. The fact is that traditional healers are diverting women with breast cancer away from health professionals who can save their lives. When we are seeing that is the best. You see that there are these satellite models here. And then there's also a spread to the other breast. This is the liver. Mm -hmm. And the ultrasound has also shown that there's a liver involvement. The doctor that Augustina turned to is known throughout Ghana. Dr. Beatrice Wiafe Adai is a breast cancer specialist. She treats many patients with the disease and fights the scourge of late presenting patients with a breast screening outreach program. Sometimes it's very difficult to counteract the things that they tell them outside the hospital. Because they tell them, oh, we will heal you without the knife. We will heal you without the drug that will cause alopexia, that will make your hair fall. So why do you go through all that, you know? So they, they believe in them. And that is one of the challenges that we are having. Dr. Wiafe is a leading figure in the fight to reduce deaths amongst breast cancer patients in Ghana. She regularly appears on television and fundraises at events like this annual breast walk against cancer. And she owns this private hospital simply called Peace and Love. As part of our investigation into breast cancer in Ghana, we asked Dr. Riafe if we could follow her work at the hospital. She agreed 
and we were allowed to film a mastectomy operation as well as sensitive consultations with patients. We are in a society mm -hmm. where breast cancer is surrounded by myths and misconceptions. And uh, people, as a young girl like this, she thinks, or a lot of people think, that when we remove her breast, it means she's not a complete woman. Some cancer sufferers not only have to cope with the shock of having the disease, but a hostile reaction from their families. Most of them, they are driven from their matrimonial home to go and stay in the outer house because of the stench. And some of them are told to go to their mother's house, to go to their families and come back when they are, they are healed. The terrible reactions of men to the disease only makes this worse. We need to educate our men as well, because it's not her fault that she developed breast cancer. So why are you divorcing her? That is the time she even needs you as the husband by her. But because the men also, most of them do not understand the disease. Dr. Wiafe has done a great job raising awareness of cancer in Ghana, but some patients have been voicing concerns about the Peace and Love Hospital. We've heard from relatives and a patient who told us they were upset about how they were treated at Peace and Love. They said to us that they were not told what was wrong with them. They were given little or no details of their treatment. And in one case, the patient wonders if her treatment was actually needed. We wanted to see for ourselves how patients are treated. So posing as a husband and wife team, my investigative colleague Anas and one of his team went undercover at Peace and Love. She's called Angela, not her real name, and she's fit and well. We made sure she had a full checkup before we started the investigation, but she's going to tell the hospital that she has breast pain and fever. This is a medical assistant at Peace and Love, and she tells Angela that there is a worrying problem with her breast. Can you touch this area? Yes, 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 actually. I feel there is some kind of uh, nodal type of you don't, you don't feel it. Something like a, it's something a like a lump. <laughs> it's like a nodule, sort of. There is something there. It, it's not distinct mass, though, but it feels like a, a lumpy type of tissue thing. Following the consultation, Angela is given an ultrasound scan and told to return two days later for the results. In the meantime, she is prescribed a bag of drugs. There are three sorts of antibiotics, two lots of painkillers, two lots of vitamins, antihistamines, and something called breast care caps. She isn't told what the medical assistant thinks may be wrong with her. The drugs cost $60. That's nearly a week's wages in Ghana. We can't understand why she's been given so many drugs without a diagnosis. So at our next visit, we ask what they're all for. What is that? What, what does it do? We have only antibiotics. What does it do? Um, antibiotics. We give it when there is an excessive pain. Usually, pain comes when maybe some kind of organism will sort of test it. Okay. So this one is to combat or maybe bring down the activities of any organism which is killing it. The pain. Mm -hmm. This one. This one is breast care. We call it breast care. It takes care of the. I mean, just the name is light. It, it takes care of the breast. At least this one will sort of relax her so that she'll be able to sleep because of the pain. Okay. And then this is a folic acid. It's a blood tonic sort of. Just one day. It's good for all women. And then this one is supporting the antibiotics because. It's like any time a person is on antibiotics, we know that certain things goes on in the blood. So it will sort of uh, boost the building up of the hemoglobin level, this one. The medical assistant seems very unclear on her diagnosis. So what does she have? Um, it could be an infection. We cannot explain where the infection is coming from. That is why she's on antibiotics.
Next, the pair are told that the scan is clear, but the medical assistant explains that what's just as important as the results of the scan is the patient's description of the symptoms. The scan did not actually say anything, but usually we don't also look at the, what the report is telling us. We depend on what the patient is telling us. So is it wise to prescribe first and then get confirmation of any illness after? A senior breast cancer specialist in the UK told us that the drugs provided were completely over the top. He said the only possible relevant medicine is the painkiller. The other drugs are unnecessary. We spoke to another patient who'd just been to peace and love. Her family don't know that she may be ill, so she didn't want to be identified. I was asking it, a lot of questions. What is happening to me? Can you please explain what is going on? Nothing was to know. You'll be fine. It's normal. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So do you feel you were properly treated? Were you frustrated? Not at all. Not at all. You go take the drugs. Go and pay. Go to the cashier and pay and take the drugs. Well, let me just ask if you, if you recognize any of these medications. Do any of these look familiar to you? Yes, I was given this one. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this one once, twice a day, morning and evening, this one. Okay. 30 minutes before eating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you don't know what these were for? No, please. If patients are seen, they're being managed, they have to understand what it's being done. What, why you're doing what investigation? Why is being given certain medication to take regarding the complaint that he presented. I think that you should clearly understand. So in summary, what I would say is, if a patient doesn't understand any of this, it's very difficult. If you came to see me and I examine you, I don't tell you anything and I ask you to take certain medication and it borders on maybe, or the medication is a clear anti-cancer drug, I, I think you get worried. Dr. Wiafe said in response to our queries that patients might sometimes require medications which may include some antibiotics before we even start with our breast investigations and that the prescription given to our undercover reporter was something that is done in normal practice. And in her words, I still insist there is nothing wrong with this. One patient of Peace and Love told us of the distressing results of her experience at the hospital. Bushra Mahama is a businesswoman and mother of five. Anas went to hear her story. She first went to Peace and Love in 2008 with a lump in her breast. In early 2009, Dr. Wiafe removed the lump from her breast and afterwards she was put on a course of chemotherapy. Throughout the treatment, Bushra says she was kept in the dark. Bushra is understandably upset and confused about her experiences. She may not have known what the drugs were, but she did recognize the vicious side effects. Mm. Chemotherapy is a poison designed to attack cancerous cells. It should be given with extreme caution as there are unpleasant side effects and it makes the patient feel very unwell. Alarmed by the fact that she felt she was getting worse, Bushra was persuaded to go to the UK to seek a fresh medical opinion. Her brother Hafiz was studying there. If you see my sister, that uh, she was too black like Choco. All the fingernail was black. She has no single hair on her. And all the body changes totally. Everything is totally changed that she doesn't have the cancer. In the UK, she was shocked when her doctors there received a short medical history from Peace and Love Hospital. 
It detailed the operations that she'd had to remove lumps from her breasts, but it said that there had never been any evidence of cancer. Frightened by this, her family asked Peace and Love for more details. Another short letter arrived listing the drugs Bushra had been given, but no chemotherapy drugs were mentioned. <laughs> Attached to this letter were two reports which again said that Bushra never had cancer. Not surprisingly, Bushra was very upset. She felt that she had been through very distressing treatment for cancer that two years later she was told she never had. We approached Dr. Riafe and the Peace and Love Hospital to find out what could have happened. Could a patient have been treated for cancer who didn't have the disease? No, says Dr. Riafe. The problem is that she was treating two patients with similar names, and by mistake, the other patient's records were given to Bushra's family. Dr. Riafe is adamant that Bushra did have cancer but was now clear of it, and that it's better to treat suspected cases than let untreated patients die. Bushra's paperwork is still unclear as to whether she did or did not have cancer. We have not seen any lab report to say that she did. And despite Dr. Riafe's confirmation, to this day, Bushra is not sure whether she needed to suffer the horrors of chemotherapy or whether it saved her life. Stories like Bushra's don't help to encourage more Ghanaians to use the services modern medical practices provide. And yet, the best chance of surviving cancer remains an early diagnosis from a doctor and a proper regime of anti-cancer medicines. And effective medicines to fight the disease could be the next challenge. New research being carried out here in Ghana is looking at medical reasons why cancer in black women is taking such a heavy toll. It all started on the background that in the United States, stage for stage, the black Americans are doing worse than the whites. The doctors here are working with the University of Michigan in America. Their initial findings confirm that black women are more likely to suffer from a rare form of breast cancer called triple negative. Unfortunately, for those patients that we are seeing that are young, um, they are, their diseases are more aggressive and mostly what you classify them as triple negative breast cancers and their treatment is very difficult. She's a very young woman. She looks quite young. 22 year old woman. 22. 32. 32. Diagnosed with them. Chemotherapy treatment often doesn't work well with these women. And the doctors told me they think it could be because historically it's been developed and tested on white people. It has become obvious that the biology of the tumors among blacks, black Americans and the white Americans are not the same. Yeah. So this may be the reason why cancer is deadlier for women of African descent. Partly so. Partly so. But Apart from that, you know, the usual challenge we have when we say it every day, late stay presentation. So in the end, it comes back to the same problem. Unless patients can be convinced to go to the hospital earlier, then even the development of the best drugs in the world won't help. If you have less than 100 patients, you're looking at maybe having between 30, 35 percent alive in five years. That's the grave nature of it. The U.S., you know, because they come early, stage one, stage two, it goes beyond 80, 90 percent. The battle to beat cancer in Africa is just beginning. Sufferers have to be persuaded to seek medical help earlier. And until survival rates can be brought into line with the rest of the developed world, the scourge of cancer will continue to stalk the continent. <laughs>